Well, thank you all so much for coming and listening to us. Um, and thank you for those of you that traveled. Uh, thank you for making the trip. Um, we're going to talk about some of the things to consider if you're building an airflow service. And as part of that, we're going to go into like, what does that actually mean when you're building an airflow service? Um, so a couple of intros. I'm Viraj, one of the co-founders of Astronomer, uh, field CTO, and do a lot of things around the community, our customers, and the general ecosystem. Yes. Pete, I lead product at Astronomer. I've been working with this guy for uh, quite a long time now, so we're super proud to be here. And it really has been a long time. So early days in Astronomer, we both looked a lot younger, and this was actually in our old Cincinnati office. Um, I used to like try to make it so I was like covered by monitors, like 180 degrees, so I'd have like no external distractions except for this little like sliver right there. And Pete, whose dog is that? <laughs> it's a cute, pretty, cute, pretty cute dog. I think the kicker here is, you know, we've been, we've been at this for six years, building airflow services for our customers, and we feel like we've learned maybe a thing or two. And I think if you had told these, these guys in, in Cincinnati maybe five years ago that we would be at an airflow summit with 500 strong, we would be super excited by that prospect. Uh, what you don't see here is the brains behind our operation, which is Paula taking these pictures, who's sitting right there. So <laughs> shout out to her. These days, we live in Brooklyn. Uh, we have an office in New York City. We also have an office in the Bay, but Viraj and I both live not together in Brooklyn. We see enough of each other in, in the <laughs> office every day. But. Yeah. but more importantly, if you're based in New York and you want to come chat Airflow or just need a place to work and you're doing data engineering, come hang at the Astronomer office. It's very centrally located. So if that's interesting, come chat with us after. All righty, so let's get into the actual talk. Um, this is a journey that we've seen a bunch of times where a data engineering team will start to adopt Airflow. Um, I usually when I give this talk, I ask, hey, who in this room is using Airflow? But given we're at the Airflow Summit, I figure that'll be a pretty, uh, pretty overwhelming answer. Um, and this will take folks a long way, right? These data engineers will kind of do the core ingestion, data modeling, et cetera, and really just deliver data sets with Airflow as a tool of choice. Um, oftentimes, what we find is that after the data engineers get started with Airflow, more users come along. Um, and unlike the data engineering use cases that kind of uh, started Airflow adoption, these new users come from different backgrounds and often have different use cases. Um, so generally, there's a, there's a lot of different folks here, right? And it's hard to tell people like, hey, you're a data engineer, so you do this. And you're a data scientist, and you do that, right? I think that those roles vary greatly between different companies. But you know, if I was to try to classify them, there's usually three buckets of people. Um, there's your analytics engineers, who are very SQL and DBT focused, and they try to deliver reports and insights. There's your data engineers that tend to start using Airflow, right? And they're the ones doing data ingestion, ETL, ELT, your classic data engineering. They tend to be familiar with Python and more object-oriented interf oriented interfaces. And then there's your data scientists. Uh, data scientists like using uh, notebooks, uh, tend to do some R, right, machine learning models. Um, and they need to do just about everything under the sun. Um, so generally speaking, these are the three personas that come along uh, inside of a company who need orchestration as part of uh, what they need to do their jobs. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, Viraj and I and a bunch of the, the folks at Astronomer have spent the last six or seven years really working on building out Airflow as a service for a lot of uh, companies that are really trying to deliver uh, Airflow to a bunch of downstream teams. And one of the common patterns that we've seen emerge really um, in the context of, of this process is that these personas often have real orchestration needs, but they're kind of a, a, a accommodated by different interfaces and are used to different interfaces. And usually there's some core center of uh, you know, knowledge in data engineering that really understands how to take workload to production. And what we see emerge is these different personas, whether it be a data analyst focused on writing SQL queries or uh, productionizing DBG jobs, or data scientists that just want to, you know, write a Jupyter Notebook and throw it over the wall to be run in production, end up really leaning on that core data engineering team to go from idea and experiment to production. And that results in a bit of a bottleneck, right? A lot of core data engineering teams end up spending a lot of their time productionizing other people's code instead of building frameworks and innovating and driving real kind of, kind of you know, movement in terms of their, their day to day. Does this resonate with folks in this room? Like, is this a pattern that you see at your company? Quick show of hands. All right, cool. So it is validated. <laughs> Obviously, like what, where you really want to go when you think about building an Airflow service as a data engineer 
is spending as much time as possible building frameworks that enable these downstream personas and really turning data engineering from a bottleneck into an enabler of the organization, really drive workload to production faster at a much higher velocity and allow folks across your data fabric to really innovate independently and productionize with the proper guardrails and you know, kind of oversight independently and autonomously. Awesome. So kind of setting the stage here, right? Now you're a data platform team and you're thinking about rolling out an Airflow service. And that's really what this talk is going to be out, right? Going to be about what does that data platform team have to think about and how does it relate to um, kind of some design choices they have to make along the way. Um, generally speaking, there's three big buckets, right? Number one is infrastructure management. Uh, number two is the compute your workloads need. And number three are the developer experiences that your end users want. Um, and the way we like to give this talk is we'll kind of go over some principles around these, and then we'll talk about some use cases in the community that we've seen on how different people have approached these problems. Um, so a quick caveat is that if you work at one of the companies that we mentioned in these slides, um, I'm, we're using your latest blog post, right? So if something is out of date or something, please come chat with us, and we'd love to learn about what you're doing now. Awesome. So let's start with infrastructure management, as it's usually the first thing you need to do when you need to run any application. Um, as seen at the Airflow Summit, there's a lot of ways to run Airflow, and there's a lot of ways to pay for Airflow, even though it's open source. So these are five folks that I know have dedicated Airflow services. Um, obviously, I'm a little biased here, but there's a lot of great ones here. Um, there might actually be more. I know some folks, some companies have Airflow kind of behind the scenes on their service. Uh, TLDR is. If you're running an Airflow service, it makes a lot of sense to start with a managed service, and there's a lot of great ones to choose from out there. But they are all different, uh, and they're all different for a bunch of reasons. Number one, because all the clouds are different. And as much as we'd like to say, hey, it runs in one cloud over here and the same over there, that's not really reality. Uh, but apart from that, right, there's really three things that I found are different with all the Airflow services. Number one is how they handle tenancy. Right? So this is a data platform team making decisions. They have to roll this out to multiple tenants. Um, how do any of these services scale across teams? Number two are the actual features that um, you are exposed. You know, what do your downstream team needs? Does your managed service give you that feature, or do they hide it behind something else, or is there a different version of that? Um, are there modifications you can make? And number three is cost. Managed services are not always cheap. What's the pricing model? How does that scale over time? And the other thing to think about with cost, right, isn't it just, it isn't just a pricing model. It's really about, like, what is the ROI you're trying to justify? How many developers do you have on this project, right? If you have 10 dedicated infrastructure engineers, maybe using a managed service isn't the best use of money. If you only have one infrastructure engineer, then maybe that's the right place to start. So there's a lot of different levers you can pull around this. Um, so let's look at two ways in the community this has kind of played out. Um, number one is this company, FanDuel. Um, how, many, how many of you use FanDuel here or have heard of them? There we go. I'm a big FanDuel player on uh, Sundays. Um, and they're one of our customers. Uh, does not make me any better at betting on football, unfortunately. Um, and another one is BMG, which does stuff with music rights. Um, and they're a Composer customer. And they wrote this great blog post on how they use Composer at BMG. Um, and both of these companies are trying to do a very similar thing, but they're accomplishing it very differently based on the managed service that they're using. Um, so one feature that our users would like on Astronomer is that people can run multiple Airflows. And that's something that FanDuel does. They give different teams their own Airflow environments. Uh, this lets their teams move really quickly, uh, kind of leverage their own patterns with, um, with writing workloads. Um, and there's actually a lot of room for cost savings based on how you write their workloads. Um, on the other side of the spectrum, BMG uses a monolithic, ar monolithic architecture where they have one composer environment for several teams. Um, that works really well for them, but one of the ways they do that is to make it so their users can do a smaller subset of things, right? It's like everyone has to go to this one-size-fits-all model, so you have to be very opinionated on the patterns your users write their DAGs in. Um, but because it's a native Google product, they can take advantage of cost-saving features with uh, things that GKE has built in natively. Um, so there's no right or wrong answer here, right? Both of these companies are very happy with their Airflow experience, and they're making their business happy. Um, they're both solving multi-tenancy issues, but they're both doing it from very different ways based on the managed service that they picked. So once you cover infrastructure management and you no longer need to administer the underlying infrastructure, then the next question really becomes what do your developers need from a workload compute perspective for their use case? Um, you know, th this is actually quite related to a good question that was asked on the panel this morning about how much 
uh, data processing you should actually do on the Airflow worker itself. And I think there are varying schools of thought about this. I think there's been like really good engaging discussion in the community. From our perspective at Astronomer, we certainly have seen our customers demand more from the Airflow worker over the past several years, especially as kind of some of the compute abstractions that we're going to mention in a follow-on slide have been introduced into Airflow. And, you know, we've, we've obviously been able to support, um, you know, some more robust processing on the Airflow worker itself. But at the end of the day, there are really different compute requirements depending on what you're trying to do. For these analytics engineering workflows that uh, are largely oriented around pushing down SQL or DBT to a data warehouse of some kind, you know, compute is generally offloaded entirely, and, and Airflow is really used as that kind of state management and, and traditional orchestration layer. In the data engineering world, we find that for a lot of these data engineering use cases that involve ingesting data from an application DB to a data warehouse, you know, consolidating legacy data sources, there is need for additional ephemeral storage and disk space. Uh, there's a need for, to manage Python dependencies across your data ecosystem inside your company. Isolation is, is, is really required, and that burden falls on the data engineering team. In the data science side, you, we, we've seen like every compute request that you could possibly imagine from data science teams using Airflow. Um, whether it be a, a GPU or uh, edge compute, you know, all sorts of things that you need to actually run these data science workloads. And at the end of the day, what this really means is in order to deliver an Airflow service to all of these downstream users, you need the right compute abstractions that are able to be configured really at the interface level, such that users don't need to do a one-size-fits-all approach, and they can actually configure the actual intersection between their code and the infrastructure to be kind of purpose-built for their needs and use case. And Airflow has great abstractions for customizing this already baked in in its ability to manage containers either via the Kubernetes pod operator, the Docker operator, uh, and more and more, more and more things that folks have, have wired up. Kubernetes pod operator probably being the one that is talked about the most, at least, for running pre-existing images with isolated Python dependencies with specialized kind of CPU and memory requests all on a Kubernetes cluster. There are also obviously a bunch of different executors, or there, there have been several talks today about plans to kind of expand the execution framework in Airflow. Uh, Celery, Kubernetes, hybrid style executors to configure the interface between that user code and the underlying infrastructure, whether uh, you're really optimizing for fast spin up time, concurrency, or isolation and uh, CPU and memory requests. And obviously, this is this has really played out in a lot of different community activity. You know, these are as Faraj mentioned, we we were referencing public blog posts here, the latest and greatest, hopefully. But GitLab and Snowflake have referenced that they run many of their tasks in Kubernetes pod operators to solve that dependency isolation problem. While Shopify and DoorDash also blog about their um, kind of exposition of either the Kubernetes and or Celery executor to their end users for the appropriate use cases. And, you know, there, again, there are plenty of examples here that you can go read up on if you just kind of go, go sleuth some of the community blog posts about this. But this ML launcher feature that Instacart has talked quite a lot about is a great example of this. Uh, so I can just read a, a, quick, a quick snippet of this. But ML launcher integrates compute backends like SageMaker, Databricks, and Snowflake to perform container runs and meet the unique hardware requirements for ML, such as GPUs, instances with large memory, and disks with high I.O. throughput. At the end of the day, that's really about exposing a good interface to machine learning engineers to get the most out of Airflow and really actually solve that kind of workload compute problem. Cool. So now that you've thought about the actual compute that your workloads need, let's talk about the way people can take, like, harness that compute and the actual uh, developer experience around that. Let me get rid of this little thing. Awesome. So it should almost go without saying, but build your DevX based on the needs of your end user. The way you describe good DevX is people use it. It's not just something that is fun to build and looks cool. Like if people aren't using it and your teams aren't working more efficiently, then it's probably not good DevX. Um, a lot of times people take like uh, DSLs on top of Airflow that are all really cool, but they're just too complex for users to actually use, um, in which case it's bad DevX. So if we think about our personas again, um, it's just really important to nail down that good DevX is different for each of these uh, because they all have different skill sets. Your analytics engineers feel more comfortable in BI tools, SQL tools, and really the DBT ecosystem. Uh, data engineers like their IDEs. They like object-oriented Python interfaces, um, and some are even kind of well-versed in Terraform and other infrastructure management. And your data scientists prefer notebooks, Python, pandas scripting, um, some R and other things that are more centric towards what, what they usually use. So there's a lot of 
examples out there about companies building DevX around Airflow. Um, so much so that the first version of the slide had like three columns and three rows, and then it was really hard to fit it all, so I made it two columns and three rows, or sorry, two columns and three rows. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> um, some of the ones here that I think are specifically interesting are um, the folks over at Updater did some really cool stuff with dbt that uh, they parsed the manifest file so that um, you could get more visibility into how uh, your dbt jobs ran in Airflow. That was actually the inspiration for Cosmos, which is this hackathon project that came out of Astronomer that uh, I think there's a few talks on. A uh, really cool way to run Airflow with dbt. Um, Brickflow at Nike is really cool because um, they recently just uh, blogged about it. And what they do is they've built a really interesting abstraction with how Airflow plays with Databricks because a lot of their workloads are Databricks centric. Um, Walmart also wrote something about how they use uh, machine learning at Walmart. And they also have a DAG builder that makes it so data scientists don't have, actually have to learn Airflow to write DAGs. Um, and I had to throw the Credit Karma one up here because they presented a Vega at last year's Airflow Summit. Uh, where they talked about how they empower data scientists with uh, this abstraction framework called Vega. There's really no right or wrong answer here. And the great part about these is so many of these tools are open source, so you can go ahead and get started with them uh, without trying to write your own. If you do want to write your own, one thing I've also run into several times is people write their own, and then the person who created it leaves the company, and three years later, they can't update it because that person's no longer there, and they can't update Airflow anymore, and so on and so forth. Um, it is not trivial to maintain your own developer interface on top of Airflow. Um, it's easy to start with. You, you, know, you can build a YAML generator, um, and then two years later, it might kind of shoot you in the foot. Um, a lot of the ones that I mentioned before are open source, and you can find them on the Airflow ecosystem page. It's one of my favorite pages on the Airflow docs, and I don't think it gets enough love. Um, but you can use something that Devoted Health wrote called uh, DAG Factory. That's a very simple thing that takes your YAML code, it takes YAML and converts it into Airflow DAGs. We at Astronomer worked on one called Astro SDK, which is a decorator style approach. Um, nothing wrong with building your own. We have built our own, but just know that it's a full time thing. It's not something you can just do part time. Um, cool, so quick TLDR of the talk, just to kind of go over some high level points. Number one is if you can, use a managed service, but just really do your homework in terms of investigating what that managed service gets you. Number two is that different personas are gonna have different needs around their compute and, uh, in, and infrastructure, and don't ignore that. You know, the cloud is great, but you have to be very intentional with how you build the cloud, and you can't just build stuff with the idea that, oh, it'll just run in the cloud, and I don't have to worry about scaling it up or down. That would be nice, but we're just not there yet. Um, and last but not least, developer experience is really important, but if you're building your own Airflow DSL, make sure you know what you're getting into. Awesome. Thank you all so much. <laughs>